$2,000 and of course by God's grace we're able to raise about $60,000. I'm trying to say something here folks. What I'm trying to say is that as an organization it is vision, vision, 10 years of vision, vision, 10 years of vision. And this is an organization we have been able to go out into Ghana, into Kenya, into Malawi. And God is so good over the past 10 years we have been able to baptize over 2,000 souls, and we have been able to plant 12 Seventh-day Adventist churches. Can I get an amen? Can I get an amen? amen? Folks, I want you to see something here. I got to move along quickly. Why did we go to Malawi? Why Malawi? Malawi is different from Ghana. A lot of people like to make the voyage and the odyssey to Ghana because Ghana has the point of no return, has tourist attractions. But Malawi does not have any of that opulence. But why did we go to Malawi? Number one, we don't believe that we must only place ourselves in one geographic location. We believe if we're truly going to adhere to the Great Commission and not see it as a great suggestion, we must be able to go out to different places and minister. So we went out to Malawi. Now, in Malawi, if you've ever been to Malawi, right, Dr. Lindsay Thomas, who was one of the first to cultivate the northern part and the central region, this region in Malawi does not have an Adventist presence. So really what that means is that we had no competition because there was no outstanding church in that geographic location. We were able to tap this significant environment. And because of that, by God's grace, this was our goals, right? I'm talking about vision, right? Vision. Our goal was to go to three unentered areas and share the gospel of Jesus and open three SDA churches. All right, this takes money, this takes money. This, this takes money, because we know that a lot of times in Africa, what happens? Most of them worship under trees. So we decided that we're gonna plant three new SDA churches and build three new SDA churches. This is something that we do. And then the second thing, our goal was to train 100 church members, right? Our goal was to set up and train leaders. Why is leadership important? Because better communities start with better leaders. So we wanted to train leaders. And by God's grace, we trained 100 leaders. And then we wanted to meet the needs of the people in the community. So let me give you some highlights. These were the leaders that came through what, what we call our Mission Driven Purpose School of Leadership. I was the main, main instructor on my end. These were the people that were graduating. Not only that, we engaged in healing. My sister came along and other medical professionals, 400 served in our wellness clinic. That's Pastor Trumacy there, food distribution. Not only that, we constructed. Now, the, AMA, the, the money that AMA got us, AMA was able to lead us to build seven water wells. Not only that, we engaged in preaching and we distributed 836 Bibles. I want you to understand something. Bibles are expensive. Bibles are very expensive. But we said to all these new converts, we're going to give them the word of God. I don't want them to backslide. I don't want them to engage in apostasy. I want them to ensure that they keep growing and they're able to grow others as well. Not only that, of course, we baptized 811. Those were the three church buildings we sponsored. So this was the day when we did the sod cutting for the churches. Not only that, we also had the unique opportunity to also minister in the prisons. We went into the prisons. I said, today we're talking about love is a verb, right? I'm bold. You see, I'm from New York City. Right? I'm, from, I'm from the heart of New York City. And for me, for me, missions and ministry, you have to go to the tough places. You have to go to the places where it's challenging. That's where mission is. That's where mission resides. So we went into the prison, and we were able to, by God's grace, in a span of two days, 24 men raised up their hand and said, we want to be baptized. So 811, folks. So how do we follow up? Because follow up is important. Because what will happen is that if there's no churches for them, they're going to go back to their churches that they were a part of. So we said we're going to hire caretakers to take care of the church. We want to ensure that these leaders that we have trained are able to groom these new souls. Folks, what I'm trying to say is this. The gospel is free. Somebody, you better write this down, put this in your mental Rolodex. 
The gospel is free, but ministry costs money. I'll say that one more time. The gospel is free, but ministry costs money. We're not able to do this without your donations. We're not able to do this without your largesse. We're not able to do this without your benevolence, without your generosity. Folk, I'm going to start it off right here in Dallas. We called it in a span of days. I'm going to say, I got you, Kofi. I got you, Kofi and Kajo. I'm going to go to this conference, and I'm going to handle business. Folk, I want you to understand something here. In order for us, I know not every one of you all can always travel and go out to these places, but support the ones that do. I'm going to say, Kofi and Kajo, I can't go with you all to Malawi, but I'll do everything I can to ensure that you all will have a successful and prosperous journey. Folk, at the end of this service, I'm going to make an appeal for donations. But I wanted to share this report with you all to show that there's still souls to be won. And if we're going to successfully proselytize and bring fruits into the kingdom, it requires everyone's efforts. It requires everyone's efforts. So at the end of the service, I'm going to make an appeal. Because this year we're going to Ghana. We're going to make an appeal for those that want to join and those that want to donate. Because we started here in Dallas with Ama, and I want to make sure I come back to this place and also raise money. So at the end of the service, I'm going to make an appeal. But I want to share this report with you all. 20 people, all I need is 20 people to give $100, I'll be able to raise $2,000. That is just my appeal today. But at the end of the service, I'll make that appeal. But I want to put this in your mind. Have you cognitively musing about this? Because the gospel is free, but ministry, ministry costs what? Money, money, money. Let's get into the word. I don't have much time. Pastor told me that. You all end by one, so I want to make sure that I started. I didn't get up early, so Pastor, forgive, forgive this. But I want to make sure that I get the word to you all here today. The word is very simple. They said love is a verb. Well, I'm crazy. I come from New York City. So my sermon title is called Crazy Love. Everybody say crazy love. Uh huh. One, two, three. Crazy love. Uh, again. Crazy love. Again. Crazy love. This is a dialogical sermon, so you have to make sure that you are staying in tune with me. Crazy love. But I want to honor the theme. The theme that all the parishioners, all the young people from the millennials to Gen Zers are convening on this auspicious Sabbath is under the theme of love is a verb. So my thesis this morning or this afternoon is simple. Love is only a verb if it is tethered to genuine kingdom building, not disingenuous kingdom building. I'm going to say that one more time because this is going to be my thesis for the message. Love is only a verb if it's tethered to genuine kingdom building, not disingenuine kingdom building. Oh, let me elucidate that and make it even much more pithy. Love, the act of love being a verb, can only happen when we engage in doing service under God's direction. Folk, don't miss this, don't miss this, this don't miss this, this this afternoon. Because a lot of us, we talk about love, but we don't show love. We talk about love, but we don't act love. If I go out there right now and scratch somebody's car, one of you will come and curse me out. Do you understand something here? We preach about this, but after we leave these four walls, love is different. I may go out there, some of y'all might not even show me some love. But my thesis is simple. Love is only a verb if it is tethered, if it is connected to genuine kingdom building, not disingenuine kingdom building. What does that mean? What does that mean? Acts 16 verse 25. This is where I'm going to respite in the service. And this is going to be the text I'm going to use. I'm only going to be here in Acts 16, so I want to exegete this properly. Acts 16 verse 25 says, About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And for sermonic emphasis, 
and the other prisoners were listening to them. I'm going to repeat that last part because my message is going to respite in this arena. And the other prisoners were listening to them. Acts 16 introduces us to the gospel globe trotter, the world-renowned theologian Paul. And what we find in this text is that Paul is engaging in service work. Paul is engaging in what the theme is called, love is a verb. Paul is engaging in actionable love. But I want you to understand something about Paul. Because Paul, in the, in the legal world, we'll call him a soy generis character. Paul was an individual who had the arsenal to be at one of the top universities. But Paul says, I'm going to leave that behind and follow after God's own will. Paul had the two kits in his hand to be a businessman, to be an entrepreneur. But Paul said, I'm going to leave this behind and become a purveyor for Jesus Christ. Paul, in his arsenal, in his two kits, Paul, in his, in his ammunition, had the ability to be a university professor. But Paul says, I'm going to leave that behind and engage in service. I'm going to treat love as a verb. But you see, this is what happened here, folks, because I want us to understand something about what we call kingdom building. We don't teach kingdom theology anymore. But I want us to understand something about kingdom building. You see, when we look in Genesis, we understand that God made us under his own image. We have his disposition. We have his character. But one thing that God said that let man have dominion over the earth. So God extended his heavenly kingdom. Now I want you to understand something here. God said that I am going to make you all in charge of this kingdom. But this is the point here. I want you to understand something here. Though we have been placed in charge of this kingdom, many of us have not been displaying that love that needs to be shown in the kingdom. So what I want us to understand is if love is truly a verb, how does that look like? Somebody put up my, my slides for me. What does that look like if love is truly a verb? If love is truly a verb, then the first element we must understand is that kingdom builders don't pursue a personal agenda. Kingdom builders pursue God's agenda. Are you all hearing me, saints? Kingdom builders don't pursue their own personal agendas. Kingdom builders pursue God's agenda. You see, Paul had the ammunition, the arsenal, to do whatever he liked. But Paul says, I'm not going to pursue my own personal agenda. I'm going to pursue God's agenda. So when we see here in Acts 16, Paul is going on a mission trip. He's going to engage in what we call love as a verb. He's going to engage in service work. But Paul, as he was going into Asia, the text tells us that as he was going into Asia, he had a vision. And in that vision, he was redirected to go into Europe. That's all that means in that text. He was supposed to go to Asia, but then he receives a vision, does not see the vision clearly, cannot really actualize what is happening in the vision. But Paul says, if God wants me to go to Europe, I'm going to go to Europe. Folk, how many of us put our personal agendas over God's agenda? Come on, somebody. How many of us do that on a continuous basis? You see, let me illustrate something here. I was back in college at Walla Walla University. I think this was after my first or second year. My brother, who was a pastor, he called me. He says, Kofi, Kofi. 
I always know when he, he's too hyped. Ah, it's not always a good thing. So he said, Kofi, 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 I want you to come with me to Uganda. Sorry, to Kenya. I said, when do you want me to come with you? In the next five days. I said, whoa, my brother, that's too short. I don't have the money right now. You know, I'm a college student. How can I make this happen? So my brother said, and this is how pastors always get you. This is how pastors always get you. They always be like, the Holy Spirit. <laughs> the Holy Spirit told me, Kofi, you have to come with me. I said, come on, why you got to do that? Why you have to do that? Why? You know the Spirit didn't tell you that. He says, no, my brother, the Holy Spirit told me that you need to come with me. I said, you sure? Hey, hey my, my man, how um, am I going to successfully raise this money? He says, Kofi, we are going to make this happen. But we have to stick on God's agenda. Because we are limited by our own agendas. But if we stick to God's agenda, something miraculous can happen. So I said, all right, all right. So God's so good. We were able to raise 5000 in about five days. I sent out emails, and people responded. But, it gets, but, but I want you to see what's going on here. We go on the mission field, and I'm not a preacher. So I said, you know, Kujo, you are the pastor. You know how to do crusades. I really don't know how to do this. He says, Kofi, you got this. You got this. I had a feeling he just wanted me to come to Kenya with him. So I said, you sure? So I started preaching, preached the first week. After the first Sabbath, only one soul decided to give their lives to God. And I was disappointed. Because I looked and heard my brother's report. He had over 100 ready to get baptized. I said, Kujo, why would you bring me out here when you know I'm going to fail? Why? He says, Kofi, we have one more week. We still have one more week. God is going to deliver. Remember, it's not on your agenda. You got to follow God's agenda. So the next week came, only three people. I didn't even want to go to the baptismal pool. I didn't even want to see Kujo. When I went to the baptismal pool, lo and behold, he had all his candidates, about 100, even the, el the chiefs of the town, he got them to become baptized. And I was just sad, I was sad, I was sad. I said, why did you bring me out here to embarrass myself? So after that, I said, Kujo, I'm no more going to engage in doing mission trips and engaging in service. This love is a verb thing. You know, I think I can just tell people, hey, God loves you, but I don't think I can really go out there and engage in missions. He says, Kofi, I want you to come with me again. I said, my brother, why are you doing this to me? Why? Why? So I said, all right, my brother, one last time. One last time. Won't you understand something here, folk? I said kingdom building is not about following one's personal agenda. Kingdom building is about following God's agenda. The second time when I went out there, the failures that I had the first time, after two weeks of preaching, after two weeks of successfully engaging in missions, God the year before, I only had one soul. But this year, after I went with Brother Kojo, Kojo convinced me that I should do this again. Kojo convinced me that I should follow God's agenda. Not only did 20 people become baptized, not only did 100 people become baptized, not only did 150 get baptized, but 166 got baptized. Because if you follow God's agenda, that is when love is fully displayed. See, it was not about the numbers, but I was following my own agenda, my own limitations. Love is only a verb if it's connected to genuine kingdom building, not disingenuous kingdom building. You see, but let me help somebody out here because 
We see here that in Acts 16, I'm just saying in the text, Paul is traversing. He was supposed to go to Asia, but where's he going now, everybody? To where? Everybody say it louder, say it louder. To Europe. Come on, everybody got to be with me. He was going to Asia, and now he's going to Europe. Europe. Everybody make sure you're following me. Make sure you're following me. God, I don't want you to miss this. He's going to Europe. So now, Paul initially had his own plans of going to Asia. Now he has to go to Europe. Now, let me tell you all something here. See, Paul had already been successful on, on his missions. Paul had already been successful on his service trips. But when God said Paul had to go to Europe instead of Asia, Paul could have said, God, you're wrong. How many of us sometimes say, see, the problem with many of us, when we don't get it the way we want it, we become angry at God. Right? We are praying for that Benz, but when we don't get that Benz, we're angry at God. We are praying for that house in the suburbs, but when we don't get it, we're angry at God. Paul did not have to follow God's lead and go to Europe, but Paul did. And why is that? And there's the principle that I want to elucidate to you all here on this Sabbath day. Kingdom builders don't put high premium on a career. Kingdom builders put high premium on a calling. Everybody say calling. Everybody say calling. One, two, three. Calling. You see, what has dichotomized the Christian faith is that many of us are pursuing a career, but many of us are not pursuing a calling. Paul could have been a businessman, a business executive, CEO of a Fortune 500. But when God came calling, he said, I'm going to give that up. He said, I'm going to follow a calling. Many of us want the trappings of a career. So we follow a career instead of a calling. We follow a job instead of a mission. We follow capitalism instead of activism. If we're truly going to be engaging in kingdom building, kingdom builders don't put high premium on a career. Kingdom builders put high premium on a calling. Okay, many of you are asking, so what is the difference between a career and a calling? Let me break that down real quick. What's the difference? So what is a job? A job is based on some basic skill or primitive skill you have acquired. After a job, you graduate to a career. What is a career? A career is a skill set that you've acquired maybe after going through vocational training or getting a degree. But a calling is something where an alarm clock doesn't wake you up. Your purpose wakes you up. See, some of us, we are engaging in passions, but not purpose. Paul said, I'm going to follow your leading, God. Because, God, I don't just want to pursue a career. I want to pursue a calling. What does that mean? Let me help somebody out here. My clicker is not working. Somebody could just go to the next one for me. All right, thank you. Uh, next, next. I want you to understand something here. Next, 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 next. Kingdom builders don't put high premium on a career. Kingdom builders put high premium on a calling. Leave it here. Thank you. I want to illustrate something here. Talking about a career and a calling. What's the difference, right? As many of us have engaged in careers, but not a calling. I was traveling. I was going to speak at a Kenyan youth retreat. I was going to speak to a group of maybe 100 young people in the Illinois. So as I was traveling to go and speak, normal day, right? right? Normal day, normal day. Took a flight, 
and was getting ready to go to the Illinois. So that day, the time my flight was going to get there, literally in the next hour, I would be speaking. So I had dressed up my suit and everything on the flight because I wouldn't have the time to change. We're talking about kingdom buildings. Kingdom builders put high premium on a career, on a calling, not a career. So I'm on the flight. Comfortable, right? Comfortable. You know, back in the day, they used to serve actual food in the flight in the 90s, early 2000s. Now what they serve you, what, peanuts? When you're really hungry, right? <laughs> really hungry, they're giving you pretzels, peanuts. So I'm on the flight, I'm going to speak. As soon as I land, they're driving me to go and speak at the Kenyan Youth Retreat. So I got my drink and I got my little pretzels. Now the brother next to me got his own pretzels but got some beer in his hands as well. You know, it's free country, right? You do you, I do me, right? So he's drinking his little Guinness, I'm drinking my little water. So naturally on a flight, sometimes there can be turbulence, right? About, you know, usually it's about two, three minutes, four minutes. Sometimes it can be 30 minutes. I've been on some rough flights where you felt like you weren't going to make it. So turbulence was now affecting this flight. Now naturally, when turbulence is affecting the flight, you want to hold your drink. You want to hold it, right? You want to hold it. So I was expecting the brother drinking his little Guinness to do the same. I have my suit on, I'm going to speak, and if he's supposed to spill this on me, I'm going to smell like Guinness. They're going to wonder why the preacher smells like Guinness, and it'll be a disaster. So I was praying to God. God, turbulence is shaking this flight. Well, hold, make sure this brother holds his drink. Folks, God didn't answer my prayer that day. <laughs> he didn't answer my prayer that day. Because the turbulence shook the flight. When it shook the flight, his drink spilled all over me. Oh, holy, holy father. I was so angry, I was fuming. I didn't even want to look at his face. If I looked at his face, Ghanaians would say, I was going to give him the slap of death. The slap of death. The brother looked at me and said, I'm sorry. In my head. <laughs> Well, I'm going to tell you this, folks. Kingdom builders put high premium on a calling because when you put high premium on a calling, it's no more about you. I want you to understand something here. At that moment, I should have cursed this brother out, gave him a piece of my mind. Gave him a piece of my mind. And even when he says sorry, I'm like, man, that's, I need a whole new suit. But I looked at the brother and said, it's all right, my brother. It's all right, my brother. I was a good man that day. Well, I'm always a good man. <laughs> but I want you to understand something here. When you pursue a calling, it's a different relationship you have with Jesus. It's a different relationship. And that is what Paul had here. We're talking about love is a verb. Folk, today, if we're truly going to engage and displaying love as a verb. We have to connect with our calling, not just the career. Mother Teresa said we must find the call within the calling. It is where our needs and our talents intersect and cross. Folks, Paul, Acts 16, follows the calling. But Paul gets into trouble. Acts 16 tells us that Paul, instead of going to Asia, he's now going to Europe. Goes into Europe, he gets into trouble. As soon as he gets into Europe, what happens? He gets to Europe, and then a girl that had a demon inside of her kept saying, you are the messenger of the Most High. You are the messenger of the Most High. Of course, naturally, it was annoying Paul. And Paul was like, I'm going to cut this out right now. And Paul used his power and said, Holy Ghost, let that demon come out. Now, this is what happens. That girl 
was a money-making machine for the people in that community. So by Paul casting the demon out of her, the money-making machine was now gone. So what did they do? Now, let me see. See, I'm a lawyer, and let me tell you something here. See, some people hate the law, but in this moment, it is why the law is important. Because those people took the law into their own hands and said, we're going to put him in a kangaroo court. Now, what is a kangaroo court? A kangaroo court says, you're not going to have a lawyer to represent you. You're not going to have a jury. If we don't like you, we just don't like you. And we're going to do whatever we want to do with you. So they take Paul and Silas to the kangaroo court. They weren't trying to hear Paul's arguments. You know, the, the Bible writers didn't put this in there, but I want to use my own imagination because they weren't lawyers, so let me put my own imagination in it. They didn't allow Paul to speak. They didn't give Paul justice. They didn't give Paul due process, right? Procedural process, substantive due process. They didn't give Paul justice, and they put Paul in prison. Well, I want, I want us to see something here. This is important, folks. Kingdom builders don't pursue the trending culture. Kingdom builders pursue the unpopular. Let me tell you all something here. When you're going to engage in what the theme says, love is a verb, when you're going to engage in demonstrating service and goodwill, benevolence to others, you are going to face some quagmires and obstacles. But I want you to understand something here. In order for us to be what? Kingdom builders. We don't pursue the trending culture. We must do something unpopular. You see, let me tell you something here. See, I'm a pastor child. You see, when we want to do a service project and it's not going to a particular church member's community, oh, they're going to make sure, whether it's the business meeting, the church board, Funding is not going to go to that project. See, I want us to understand something here. A lot of us, if it's not going to our places of comfort, we don't want to support that. A lot of us, we don't want to engage in what we call dangerous missions. We want to play it safe. Folk, I'm looking for people of vision this morning. Look, for people here, you all are talking about love is a verb. You all are talking about love is a verb then we need to start doing ministry in unpopular ways. We need to start doing ministry in unpopular areas. Let me tell you something, from New York City, I used to take out my young people to the projects. Some of my members would even get robbed sometimes, but I said, folks, we are not going to successfully minister to the word if we don't go to the places which is seen unpopular. See, Paul, oh. <laughs> He thought he was doing something good for Christ, right? Gets himself in prison and is about to die. Does not know what's going to happen the next day. I have a lot of airplane stories, right? <laughs> I was flying to Ghana. Do another mission trip. I say we do this every year. I was flying to Ghana. And I was with another staff member of ours, Dr. Kennedy. So, unfortunately that day, we procrastinated, right? Naturally, you have to be there three hours. And you know, sometimes I'm overly confident, right? I said, oh, JFK is just 15 minutes by the house? Oh, we'll get there. But New York traffic is bad, I'm telling you. For Yesterday I was driving in Dallas, I said, whoa, but New York traffic is bad. New York traffic is, cars don't move. So unfortunately, that day, we got caught in traffic. And unfortunately, the two-hour period of duration that you need to be before the flight, the flight was to take off at 6 p.m., but we arrived at the airport at 5 p.m. I said, whoa, I don't know if we're going to make it. Now, at that time, I didn't have TSA pre-check, so I had to go through the long line. Have you ever been to JFK? Those lines are ridiculous. Uh, the lines are ridiculously long. So it was five, the flight is leaving at six, and I cannot miss this flight because I'm speaking on, on, on Saturday, and I need to make sure that I am on this flight, this flight gets me on time, and I get to the place. 
So I'm at the airport. Now, because I'm so much in a hurry and trying to make this flight, I didn't look at my boarding passes. So they gave me my boarding passes, but I didn't look at them because I'm assuming they've, they've done their job, my boarding passes are correct, and I need to catch this flight, right? I put trust in the American system, unfortunately. But I want you to understand something here. Got into the lines, we're looking at the time. I'm like, six o'clock, time is ticking, time is ticking. So we get up to the counter where they need to check your ID and your boarding pass. As soon as I show them mine, and you know, New York, <laughs> New York people are, are, are cruel sometimes. I gave them the boarding pass. They said, oh, they gave me the, the wrong boarding pass. Immediately, they called security. Security escorted them out. I said, folks, I have a flight to catch. Can you all just have them printed and send it down or something of that nature? I have a flight to catch. Look, I have a flight to catch. I cannot miss this flight. Please, I need to board this flight. They weren't trying to hear me out. So I said, Ken, we're going out to do something that's unpopular. Because guess what, folks? See, a lot of us will rather go on a vacation than a service trip. We would rather spend, when we have our two weeks off, we would rather stay home than try and go out and do some service work. Now, we are about to do something that's unpopular. Going out there, my Christmas holidays, just finished law school examinations, should be resting my mind, getting ready for the next semester. I shouldn't be doing this. But I want to understand something here. Love is a verb, and sometimes you have to do unpopular things. And this is something sometimes can be seen as unpopular. But now, the flight I need to catch, I can't make it no more because they gave me the wrong boarding pass. So I said, Ken, man, I don't know if you can do this, man, but can you please, please tell them that you have another friend that's coming? And can you please hold the fight? Right? I'm not no dignitary, so I don't know if they'll do it for me, right? I'm just local Kofi Chumacy, right? right, right? They can't even pronounce Kofi Chumacy, right? So local guy. I said, can you please tell them? Ken said, Kofi, I'm going to do all I can, but you know I don't really have that much power. So I go all the way back, went back to the counter. What did they say? I'm sorry. I said, oh, God. They couldn't even fast track me to the line. So I got my boarding pass. I'm looking like a crazy madman running through. People say, hey, you can't cut the line. I said, look, I got to catch this flight. I got to catch this flight. I got to catch this flight. I'm telling you, 6 o'clock had gone. I don't know if the flight was still going to be there. I went through. Uh, uh, the scanners, everything was good. Then I ran all the way to my gate, ran all the way to my gate, ran all the way to my gate, ran all the way to my gate. They said, are you Kofi? I said, I'm Kofi. This is your lucky day. Your brother told us that today you all are going on a mission trip and we decided to hold this flight for you so you don't miss this flight. I want you to understand something here. I want you to understand something here. Kingdom builders. Kingdom builders. Don't pursue a career, they pursue a calling. Kingdom builders, when they engage in service, they understand that you gotta pursue the unpopular, yeah? Come on, Texas, Dallas, what are we, what are we gonna do? Today, love is a verb. What are we gonna do to minister to these people here? Because some, some of these people probably just see us on Saturday, that's it. What are we going to do? What daring, audacious, bold service are we going to do? Are we just going to wait for those to come to Ghana to fill up the church? What are we going to do? We need to pursue the unpopular. I don't have that much time. I don't have that much time. Pastor said I got to end it at one. I don't have that much time. But I want us to understand something here. As I get to my final point, I want to make an appeal. But before I get there, I want to get to my final point. Because sometimes you got to pursue the unpopular. Eh? Eh? It's not about just going to the nursing home. What are we going to do to ensure that there are laws to protect the homeless people? What are we going to do to ensure there are laws that make sure our kids are not being miseducated? What are we going to do to ensure the police are no more killing our young boys and girls? What are we going to do to make sure that people are not in a cycle of poverty? What daring, 
audacious action of love are we going to do? Are we going to pursue something that's trending? You see, the problem with many of us is that we engage in symbolic justice of service, not in substantive acts of service. See, I like the Sabbath school you all do. I know Elder, I can see him. Put in the energy and time. Elder Siena was put in the energy and time. Folks, that's dedication. I want you to understand something here. Pursuing the unpopular is not always great. You don't always don't get an award. You don't get lauded. You don't get praised. But if love is truly a birth, we got to engage in genuine kingdom building. I need to end this off. I need to end this off. 1625 says about midnight Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the other prisoners were listening to them I want to make a nuanced subtle point it's a bit minutiae but it's important here you see in that social ecosystem when they put you in prison, and naturally, if you're one who's a purveyor of Christianity, they want to make sure you suffer. They want to torment you as much as possible. So here, what did I say? Paul didn't get no justice. He didn't have no lawyer, no jury. So now he was put in the jail cell. Paul thought he was doing something good, but he gets put into this situation. I want you to understand something here. Paul is chained. And I want you to understand how they did it in this system. So to make sure they torment those who are purveyors of Christianity, they'll put a clamp and chain you to directly to the ground. They do that because they want you to suffer as much as possible. So what they did with Paul and Silas was that they stressed them out they were on the floor, right, on the floor. Let me demonstrate for you all. They were on the floor, stretched out, right? Hands chained, hands chained, right? On the ground. But I want you to understand something here. Because kingdom building, in order for us to engage in kingdom building, we need to understand this ethic here. Because he was chained to the ground. Chained to the ground. Made sure he could suffer. Put in darkness. And the only place that Paul could truly look on the ground, chained, the only place Paul could really look is where, folks? Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. The only place he could look where? The only place he could look where? The only place he could look where? Paul and Silas did not give up because when they looked up, they saw a God who does not give up on them. They saw a God who cares about them. Folks, if we're going to engage in what love is a verb, we got to look up. Well, you play something softly for me, please. You play so something softly for me, please. Now, I wanna make, I'm going to make two appeals. I want everybody to see this here. See, Paul and Silas, they were able to still rejoice because kingdom builders don't accept their lives. Kingdom builders lead their lives. The zeal for spiritual growth starts with the zeal of self-leadership. Yeah, we want to grow in our faith. It starts with leading ourselves to that next level faith. Kingdom builders don't accept their lives. They lead it. Yeah, I've been through a lot. Family left me. Friends deserted me. 
but I'm still going to lead my life. Because God still sees value. When they looked up, God saw value on Paul and Silas. As I end, I want you all to see this. $20, right? $20. It's not that much, not that much. I know some of us are millionaires in here. It's not that much. I'm going to do something with this $20. I want you all to look at this. I'm going to crumple up this $20 here. I want you to look at this. Crumbling up this $20. Crumbling it up. I'm going to throw it on the ground. Stomp on this $20. Dirty it up a bit. Dirty it up a bit. Right? Stomp on it. Dirty it up. Dirty it up. Yeah, I'm getting it real good. Real good. Real good. Twenty dollars been through a lot, but guess what, folk? Guess what, folk? That's right, Auntie. If I saw that twenty dollars on the street, crumbled and all, crumbled and all, I would still pick it up because it still has. Value. Won't you understand something here today? No matter where you've been in life, God sees value in you. And because God sees value in you, don't just accept your life. Lead your life. Yeah. Pursuing this love is a verb. You can get to some crazy things. <laughs> but what did I say my thesis was? If love... It's truly a verb. It must be connected to genuine kingdom building. My appeal is simple. My appeal is very simple. Love is a verb. If you're truly a kingdom builder, it's not an optional engagement. It's an optimal engagement. You want to grow in your faith. You've got to be a kingdom builder. We're going to build this kingdom. God has entrusted you with the kingdom. So are you going to stand up? Are you going to engage in this act of love? So I get ready to make this appeal. I love speaking in prisons. And that day when I spoke to these men, some of them facing life, gonna be in there forever, won't see their families again. Yeah, I had the opportunity to go and come out. But well, these men are stuck there. But I said, if love is a verb, I gotta do what? Be unpopular, right? It's not optional. I gotta be genuine. 24 men decide to give themselves to God. Inmates. Cage life. My, my message to them that day was simple. Cage life. But a cage life does not mean a caged mind. God can still provide you spiritual emancipation, freedom. Put your lives in God. Well, Amma, my homie, I wish I could say her nickname, but it might get me into trouble. But Amma, <laughs> last year around this time, went to the ASI conference. She didn't have to do this out of her own schedule. But Amma said, Kofi, you all are raising $60,000. I can't go to Malawi. But when I gave the call to Amma, Amma said, she didn't even hesitate. I'm going to do it. She went up there and sealed $2,000 for us. Folk, my appeal is simple. You can put my slide back up for me. I'm making two appeals, right? This first appeal. Love is a verb. I know. 
Many of us have our limitations, and that's fine. But in that same spirit that I'm a utilize and said, Kofi, I'm going to do everything I can. Even if, even if I can't go, I'm still going to help you all secure this money. All I need today, $2,000, that's my goal. I just need 20 people in here today to give $100. There's more than 20 in here. One person can even give 2,000. I want to make it simple. My flight, I'm getting ready to leave right after this service. Just here for a limited time. But I want you to understand something here. Kingdom builders have to pursue the unpopular. Even if you all can't engage, travail, and labor with us, your spirit can still be a part of our trip. 2,000. I'm not going to close this appeal until I get this 2,000. By faith. But we said love is a verb, right? It's not just a statement we're reading, right? It's not just a statement. Love is a verb. The options are up there. This hundred dollars. Any of those options work? I don't got much time. Any of those options there? Or even if you can't donate today, just text the number. Anybody here? God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Folk. God bless you. I'm a, some of them have it in their hands. If you can kindly, if you just raise it up, I'm always just come and get it from you. Okay, someone write it down. Okay, 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 thank you. You got it. Thank you. That's all, 20 people to give 100. Okay, okay. Thank you. If the young lady can please get the 100 from Dr. Yabois as well. Okay. Thank you for helping out. Thank you for helping out. 2,000. You don't have the cash, you can just cash app it, Zell. Love is a verb. Action can take place in different ways. Help us engage. And Pastor, you can come up as we get ready to pray. Pastor Kuma, if you could come up. Let's genuinely build this kingdom. Pastor's getting ready to pray. But well, we still need to raise this 2,000. I know they're taking down the names. Love is a verb. Help us in kingdom building. I want to make a second appeal. 
The first appeal still remains. Keep donating. But I want to make the second appeal. Maybe some of you are saying, Preacher, I haven't done enough. I want to find unique ways to be a purveyor of the gospel. I want to be a kingdom builder. What did I say, everybody? One, two, three. Kingdom. Kingdom. I want to be a kingdom builder. May God give me the zeal. I've lost that zeal. I once had that zeal, but I've lost that zeal. With Pastor and myself here, we just want to pray over you today. Wherever you are, don't be afraid. Come forward. We're going to sing number six. Six. Wherever you are. God bless you. Just softly a bit, softly a bit, just softly a bit. Wherever you are, come forward, come forward, come forward, just come forward, come forward, come forward, come forward, come forward, come forward, come forward. We don't have a lot of time. We don't have a lot of time. Come All forward. All the youth, can you come up front as we commit you in, into the hands of God? Because um, you live in a dangerous world. Thank you so much. Last week, Lama uh, High School. A student was shot, I think, at 6, o 6 o'clock a.m. and killed. Uh, by God's grace, our young people are still with us. Not because they, uh, they go to uh, a safe zones, but it is because of the protection of God. Though, um, Delta, are you going to pray? Yes. and commit the young people into the, uh, God's hands. He has been taking care of them and we want to appreciate what he has been doing and we want to rededicate them into the hands of God as we sing him. Can we all stand? Yes. Yes. affirmation and can motivate others as well to really give their zeal to God. I don't have much time, so wherever you are, just come forward, come forward. Don't waste a lot of time, just come forward, just come forward, wherever you are. And we want to make this a special prayer as Pastor and I pray. All right. I'll pray and then Pastor, you finish it off. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we want to thank you for the service today. Amen. That love 
is only and truly a verb if we genuinely want to be kingdom builders. Pray that, Lord, everyone here, may you give them the zeal to not just accept their life, but to lead it so that they can be purveyors of your word. May love as a verb not just be a mere statement, but something that they all embody. Because the act of service is not a one-time event. It is a lifestyle. Amen. 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 Afi ye nyan kupon ye tuwa so dawase. Ye wa domini mo blu huna e tuudia huye. Throughout this week, Mama, your young people, we about him every single day. Da, we have a bomb pay. We are doing it. Ah, we made a bomb pay. Eba, ne we are doing more share on that. We be born in Bia. We are going to come here. We are doing more more born in Free Homa. We are on Saturday. We are more free. So, we are more born in Sunday. We are going to come here. Said the boy. I will be remaining under your feet until you come at the second time. Already, the parents, that is why we have brought them. Touch them individually. From today, all these young people will continue to grow, building on God's agenda and not their own. Yangu pamo ya dedicati omo di omo share wenze biu, uradi shira o. Ma ba na unasi ni na uradi kanya bom le shira yeni na. Na watu ya di ya ni mo ni mfi ya di ya ni mo ni na. Uradi bibi pani biwa ya ni moa. For two minutes wa hundi si ano kwa mai. Na fe hu ya mabo ma kuma ako. E wa Jesus di munti. Amen. Doctor, we thank you so much for coming.